Hang on. Hi, my name is Kathleen Richardson and I'm founder of the Campaign Against Porn Robots. Well, you probably know me more because I was the founder of the Campaign Against Sex Robots, but here at the campaign, we changed our name because we don't think they are sex robots. On the one hand, they don't have sex bodies, and the other hand, there's no sex that's going on between them. They're objects. Uh, what we do think they are is pornography. Um, and that's what we, we're writing about. And that's going to be the perspective that I explain uh, when my book is published next year um, on the end of love. So um, what we've decided to do is want, we wanted to bring you a series of discussions about technology, about questions about human experience and existence and our relationships with each other. And um, we feel that uh, this is going to be the first in many, this is episode number one in the first of many, we hope. And our question today is, are humans an empathetic species? Well, I guess um, we need to break down that question a little bit. So when we talk about humans, we mean there are two sexes, there are males and females. So are men um, less empathetic than women? I mean, that's the, the stereotype and there's lots of evidence that men commit more violent and sexual uh, acts than, than females do. And it's certainly a psychological point of view. So Simon Baron Cohen is someone who says that men are less empathetic than women. He argues that they're actually, they, they systematize and they don't have empathy. Um, are women, does that mean women are more empathetic than men? Or is it just that by contrast with men, they appear more empathetic? Or could it be that women don't have the same kind of physical, economic, social and political power in society? So. Uh, can't exercise violence in the way that men do. So these are the kinds of questions I, I think related to, is there, is there sex differences between empathy between males and females? And then there's adults and children. I mean, certainly children are, are just born with the empathy, you know, born uh, ready for attachment and um, connection with uh, their caregivers, usually their mothers or their fathers or extended family or, or someone close to them. And then there's the other question. So the empathy, what is empathy? So, uh, you know, quite simply empathy is about thinking, feeling, experiencing and responding appropriately to someone. It's the idea you can put yourself into somebody else's shoes, see the world through their eyes or maybe feel the world as they do. Um, and it actually is a, you know, as a term, it's only 100 years old, just over 100 years old. And it was developed by uh, a, a psychologist, Edward B. Titchener, who adapted it from the German word Empfehlung, meaning feeling into. So this idea that we're put yourself into the other person's shoes. And arguably, an absence of empathy, um, you know, without empathy, the, the kind of distress viewing somebody else's distress, if you don't have empathy, you can't even recognize the distress in others. So um, these are the kinds of questions that we're gonna be asking. And why is it important? Well, these questions are important because we seem to be living in a world where on the one hand, we have these values of equality and uh, politics of, uh, of living with each other. And then on the other hand, we have these uh, a kind of a, a brutal mass pornographic industry that is um, filming, photographing and circulating images of the most extreme torture. And then as we'll see from our guests, there are actually practices going on at the very direct and proximate level of experience that are actually forms of torture but are not recognized as such. So without um, further ado, I would like to welcome my guest, Gian Sarsen. So let me stop sharing this screen for a minute. Um, I'm Jean. Jean, Jean sorry. It's uh, <laughs> right. Has my screen stopped sharing? Yes, good. Um, and Linda McDonald, who are human rights defenders, feminist activists, independent scholars with many published works and grassroots supporters of women who have survived non-state torture and sexualized exploitation perpetrated within intimate relationships. 
expanding their work to build knowledge um, of the global forms of non-state torture and how it poses the risks for femicide. Their work, which began in 1993, included developing groundbreaking S NST victimization, traumatization, informed care. And we will certainly be talking about that. As co-founders of Persons Against Non-State Torture, their efforts have been uh, driven to acknowledge it as a distinct human rights crime. Hearing women from Canada, the US, UK, Western Europe, the Philippines, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, victimized and women victimized in prostitution and pornographic exploitation. They've contributed their stories. So they've informed your work and your knowledge and your understanding of this area. And um, since 2004, they have participated in NGO panels at the United Nations in New York, Geneva and Vienna. They've developed resources, educational presentations nationally and internationally uh, in the UK, the US, Spain, Portugal and, and, uh, and Bosnia Herzegovina. And recently they contributed in New York to the NGO on the CSW Women's Human Rights Teaching, Learning and Advocacy Resource. Um, and they also just presented, goodness me, you have a very busy schedule, at the Canadian Sexual Exploitation Summit di uh, Disrupt Demand event. Now, they have a book coming out, Women Unsilenced, Our, Refuture, Our Refusal to Let Torture Traffickers Win, which will be released this summer. And um, hopefully we're gonna talk a bit about that. So I guess as well, what's really important about uh, these uh, episodes that are different from what's going on in mainstream academia is they're not only bringing in a kind of uh, a, a, a perspective of, a radical feminist, or as you call it, a relational feminist perspective, which we'll talk about. But it's also, it's not an academic topic. These are real events, real harms that are going on to real human beings. So if we're going to have a discussion about empathy and, and, and whether we are an empathetic species, we've got to really look at what's going on um, at the level of being between human beings. And without further ado, um, welcome. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Thank you for yes. having me. Um, so I have some questions for you. So I think we'll just kick off with, um, if you could tell us a bit, and I mean, I've just given a bit of an explanation, but tell us about your work and what, and what you do. Well, I can tell you how we started. We're both nurses, public health nurses. And um, we started one night a week, a small nursing practice, helping anyone who, who'd been harmed in violence in some way in their life. And six months into the work, a woman came to us and started unfolding the whole story of how she was tortured, born into a family who tortured her from infancy. And she was in her late twenties when she started working with us. So that changed our whole focus of the work. And we realized that um, there was others, must be others in the world like her. So we started reaching out in our province and in, of Nova Scotia and met five other women who have been tortured the same way, tortured and trafficked in, in, in pornography and some into, into prostitution. And then we just, it just branched out from there. We started a website and we had women from all around the world contact us and say, we know you know, whenever we go anywhere to tell our story, people don't believe us. They say that we're lying or that we're mentally ill or that they don't, uh, they only deal with state torture. There's no services for anyone that's been tortured in family or in human trafficking. So we realized that there was a great need in the, in the world and we just, we've kept at it since then and spoken to thousands of women. I just had two emails this week from young women who are telling us the same stories that we heard 28 years ago. It's, it still is tragic. We can't, we have no places to tell them to go to get care because there's no centers except for one in Canada that we know of that really identify as helping women who've been tortured from the time they were young or married into uh, relationships that they were tortured in. So here we are still 28 years later. We're hoping with our book, it'll launch the reality a little more widely and more clearly, and that um, we'll start getting some um, people really interested in providing distinct services around victimization and traumatization of non-state torture. Yeah, um, thank you for that. That's a, 
well, very difficult work. So why have you, why have you chosen the term torture? Why, why not use the term sexual violence? I mean, what was it uh, specifically about the kinds of acts or experiences of the women coming to you that in your mind, you know, made you think, right, this is not just every, this is not violence. Because as far as I understand, your work looks at very extreme forms of, of violence. Is, would that be correct? Th that's correct, Kathleen. Um, the reason we went there, from a feminist perspective, naming correctly is important because naming validates a person and what it is you've experienced. So when the first woman came to us, her name is Sarah. That's not a real name. That's the name that uh, she chose. Um, when she came to us, we had to listen to what she was disclosing. And then I guess the issue of empathy or caring, we had to try to understand what it was she was trying to relate to us. And when she started naming torture, um, we thought, well, that we couldn't find anything in the literature about non-state actor torture. There wasn't even a name for it, actually. We didn't know that in 1993. Um, we didn't discover the term non-state actors, if you will, until we were at the UN uh, in 2004. And we had gone to the UN, this is a little of a sidetrack getting there, but we had gone to the UN in 2004 to the Commission on the Status of Women um, with the term non-political. And of course, <laughs> mm. you know, a, a woman said to us that, that you can't say it's not political. Everything is political. We knew that, but we couldn't find a term. And they said, well, Amnesty International had written this uh, booklet and published it in 2000 about non-state actors and the harm that they inflict against women in the private sphere. So we grabbed onto that and said, okay, that's what we were looking at. And then we said non-state torture. So once we were listening to the torture, we also knew as women, um, a lot of our work is dismissed, you know, under patriarchy and through misogyny, it's just that it's not paid attention to. So we knew that we had to really cement um, our language, our naming into the reality of what torture is. So with nothing that we could find around non-state actor torture, we decided that we had to create a model that really could not be questioned in the fact that Yes, these are the acts that women are telling us. And the global reality is that these are the same acts that state torture, torturers inflict. And this was evidence, global evidence, you know, around the world when they talk about state torturing, they have this list like electric shocking, water torture, caging, cutting, hanging, burning, sexualized victimization, you know, torture, rape with objects, animals. So in studying the state torture, and that's a reality that was accepted, we said, okay, this is what women are also telling us that happened in relationships in their private, in their private sphere. So we have to name it, show it, and say, this is what women are, are telling us. So you have to listen you have to understand and you have to accept that this is what's going on on this planet in relationships and around the world. And I just add to that, we didn't call it sexualized uh, violence because there's more than the sexual, there's sexualized torture, but under the umbrella of torture because the caging and the shackling and the waterboarding and the electric shocking, those aren't always sexualized, sometimes they are. So there's always a sexualized component in the torture, but it's a larger umbrella of violence on the continuum than, than the sexualized violence. Like right. physical, psychological, spiritual, yeah. you know. Yeah, and I just want to say how important that is that, first of all, naming something 
that was there that existed that didn't have a name finding a name and that struggle that you must have went through um, and to have it recognized in a way I mean it's profoundly important as as feminists that we do this with we we inherit terms all the time like I inherited the term sex robots mm -hmm. from a patriarchal culture and mm -hmm. it took me quite a long time to kind of unpack it and start to re you know look at the look at the whole field but through a, a radical feminist uh mm. prism so that's it you know that was profound and and how i mean that woman who you met sarah she probably told her story to somebody else she, she may have told her story once or never or a hundred times but you were there and you listened and you you took it seriously and you responded to her so um, thank you for responding to her. And obviously that began a, a very extraordinary journey. I will ask you about some of the, the kind of legal dimensions of this because I've been going through your papers and it sounds like there's a lot of committee level work that needs to take place to have these um, types of acts recognized. Um, Can now, I just say something? Yeah, yeah sure. I, I just wanted to thank you when you said that we listen but you're listening well yeah and and that is a relational uh respect you know that we that for linda and i we always appreciate and i think it's important that when women are listening to other women that we recognize it and also name it so i just wanted to say that back to you because Thank i you. think that's what you're doing too right now yeah, I well, um, thank you. Let's let's talk about relational feminism because um, I I looked on your website and I put the links and everything or everything that's related to the book and uh, in the video um, links. Uh, but maybe you could describe what relational feminism is. You go ahead. Oh. Well, for me, um, the reason that it's intimate relation relationally uh, is because if you're going to walk with someone through their journey in this case we had to confront human evil uh, because um, what Sarah introduced us to over time exactly we had to confront human evil so that that relationship we had to look at relationships on a continuum around the violence. You know, you can start with neglect. It can be intentional or unintentional in the fact that um, in that relationship, people aren't understanding uh, what, that, what neglect is. It can go then to abuse and it progressed into torture. And of course, there's all the subgroups, if you will, like human trafficking, pornography, you're introducing a new one around porn robots, you know, as our society <laughs> keeps moving along in very destructive ways, and into the issue of femicide, those were relational issues for us. Mm -hmm. And because our work is founded on the fact that from our perspective, we have a relationship with to and for self. Like even from the moment we're born, we start trying to understand who I am, you know, who do I want to be? What kind of person do I want to be? That's very relational. And for the women that we work with, because uh, we they come to us often, as you've already mentioned, that they don't know they're human beings you know that's a new thought they don't know some of them don't even perceive they have a physical body or skin that's very relational that they have to develop that relationship with themselves so that was the fundamental um, concept that we brought into the practice and as public health nurses that was my practice too you know working with children in school it was, um, I taught some classes in school and they were relational. You have a relationship with yourself. And this was, um, they were like nine, 10 year olds. And I have like a thousand 
evaluations on almost a thousand from them. And they said that was the most important thing they learned, that they had a relationship with themselves. That was a new thought. And because the uh, lessons involved sexuality too and involved relational violence, um, often parents uh, were concerned that they thought their children were too young to learn about sexuality and puberty and um, pregnancy, if you will. Um, so I would invite them to come to the class. And often parents said, I had no idea my children were asking the questions um, they were asking. And some of the parents even said, I did not know that I had a relationship with myself. You know, so that was a new thought too. So that was the foundation that Linda and I took into our, our practice when we, um, like Linda mentioned, we had started a one night um, a week uh, private practice. So that was the foundation uh, of where we started from. And then we took the relational feminism to them to explain to them patriarchy mm -hmm. and how it affects their relationship with themselves and all the relationships they have they were all, most of the women, they, they had no other, no people in their lives except for torturers. So when you tell children, you know, go to the good person to tell, or they didn't have anybody like that. They were surrounded by torturers. So we had to take them to their relationship with themselves to build from there. They had no other place to start from. And it's, a pr it's proof that that's enough because they have they, you know, some of them have healed from that place of knowing that they have a relationship with themselves in a world that is patriarchal and minimizes and invisibilizes them to the point that they're not seen as humans. That is, um, wow, amazing. And um, uh, echo some of my own uh, beliefs and values that we're developing in the, in the campaign. Like we want to cultivate a politics of love and how do we do that? We do it through relationship with each other. Um, but unfortunately, before we get to empathy and love, maybe we'll talk about some of the, the torture that, that people are telling you about their experiencing. I just wanted to remark on something. I've seen your torture wheel and I tried to bring it up, but I couldn't get a big enough version. So I'll also include that in the video. But I, I liked your model because it included animals. And I guess, I mean, we know that abuse happens to women or torture happens to women, torture happens to children, but it also happens to animals and you included that. Perhaps you could just explain why you also um, factored that into your model. Well, animals are so important in so many ways to the women's lives from the time they're little tiny children, because we know how children love their animals. So the torturers use those animals as a way to entrap them even more. They trick them into believing that they've tortured their animals to death or that um, they witness their animals being tortured to death by their perpetrators. So it's such a horrendous violation to them because often the animals are the only beings that they trust because they're surrounded by, by torturers. Or uh, in, in uh, adulthood, women will often stay in a relationship because of their animals, because they don't want to leave them behind, because they feel closer to their animals than they do to the, the perpetrators. And also, they, if they don't feel that they're human, they identify with the animals. And then they're used in, in bestiality. You know, there's a, a, often a very common theme of bestiality in the torture, another, another way to dehumanize the survivors and to bond the, the perpetrators. So animals are always in, in the stories and we all always think of how the animals must feel too, to be so degraded as, as, as the children or the women are. So if we're gonna look at all species on the earth, they, they deserve to be thought of and cared about as well. Yeah. Well, I think it's very important, actually, and I think you're absolutely right. You just, again, it's like listening and responding to what people are telling you and what's going on in people's lives. It's very different from a typical academic approach, which kind of, um, uh, you, you know, decides in advance what the problem is and ignores all these other. And clearly there is, you know, there is evidence that um, 
I, without using the, um, a sadist will torture animals, you know, so that a precursor to their uh, violent behaviors or in, alongside their violent behaviors will be torture of animals. Mm -hmm. And clearly there's a vast, well, well, we'll come on to like how it relates to pornography and prostitution in a minute. So um, there's such a, a, I'll just add to what Linda said, um, Kathleen. It's also the concept of respecting that as humans, we violate boundaries so massively. And that means when we treat animals like Linda described, we're, we're violating boundaries in, in very destructive ways. And I think we have to name that here again, it's naming it and we call it animalization in, in our uh, work because um, the boundaries have been so extremely violated. The boundaries against the animals and against uh, the women and girls. We've had a few men who have contacted us who have spoken about their victimization that they suffered too, or the peer-on-peer -peer, uh, victimization that they were forced into. But it is to name, um, the issue of boundary violations and know what boundaries uh, we are violating. That's, we have to name that. Yeah. And what's extraordinary in some countries like bestiality is still, is still legal. Illegal. So mm -hmm. a few years ago that Denmark, like a European country, mm -hmm. um, and it's quite extraordinary what goes on because um, with the boundary violations of infants and children, it's illegal, people are still doing it, it's mm -hmm. illegal, and they're creating these networks to carry out these illegal acts. But in some countries, it's actually legal to torture animals um, for gratification. So yeah, a huge problem. I've just, I'm not gonna go, I've just uh, started reading P Peter Singer's Animal Liberation. So it's a real eye opener. Um, so in terms of the, um, I'm, I'm trying to get a picture. So you've described a bit about the kinds of acts that the women and, and children and animals are suffering and their interrelationships, how they're connecting with each other, how they're part of a systematization, a systematization, if you like, of torture. The women who come to you, and presumably it's women when they get to a certain age, which means there's lots of children that are not reaching you because they don't have the structures in place. Uh, so they come to you as adults when they've got an opportunity. Um, what is, is there any anything unique about the people who come to you? Is there anything about, is, are these individual men who are torturing these women? Are they from a certain class? Are they of a certain uh, ethnicity over another? You know, are there any patterns in the kind of torture practices in, under patriarchy? You mean for the the yeah. types of acts that they create? Yeah. I, I, think, I would say that there's torture is universal. It doesn't matter who is doing the torturing. It, every, every woman that has shared intimate stories, their stories are often the same over and over and over again often the language of the torturers are the same for the ones we know that are non-state actors. <clears throat> and it's amazing that somebody could be in Australia and they're using the same language as we're hearing in Canada. It's, it's like, we call it a co-culture that with Sarah that she came to us. It's like, this is their pleasure. This is what, motivates uh, their existence, I guess, if you will, if you're driven by pleasure, which I guess like the porn uh, robots are the same thing, you're, you're, you're motivated by the pleasure of what you do. But as far as who the torturers are, we have had no limitation of who that could be. You know, they're, they're men, they're women, uh, you know, um, they come from all walks of life. They're professionals. 
they go to work, you know, they can be physicians, they can be nurses, they can be social workers, clergy, politicians, poly lawyers, yeah, fishers, <clears throat> you know. Um, you know, we've had nobody tell us that their perpetrator was um, the janitor, but that doesn't mean the janitor could not be also uh, a torturer. But we do, predominantly the people are people of privilege, most of the, in, in the Western culture, yeah. you know, um, if you look at other forms of uh, torture like FGM, that's cultural. So that's a, that's a different kind of non-state torture. But in the, in the family sense, westernized non-state torture, there's the, the youngest uh, that came to us, she was 17 and the oldest was in her late eighties, early nineties. So the age range is, and we don't speak other languages. We only speak English. So if we could speak other languages, probably women from Spain or from South America would contact us as well. But um, the common theme is that they've never been taken to court. They've never been held accountable. So they're still out there looking, they groom themselves in the community to look like highly respectable individuals. The same as the priests used to get away with, right? That we know that's a, that's a gimmick, that, that's gone now. But these people, because we, we know some of them from the, the women that we know, um, they walk around and, and look highly respected in the community and, and are never suspected. You know, some people like to say, well, they have to be mentally ill. Well, they're not mentally ill because they're highly functional people in society. So that's, that's they're just sadistic uh, perpetrators that have never been held accountable yet. Mm. And um, I was interested in, I wanna pick up on something what you said about the languages being echoed. So does this mean, um, so in my book coming up, I, I talk about at the level of direct and proximate experience, there's stuff like this that goes on. And then it's filmed and reproduced and circulated, isn't it, through uh, films and images, uh, through pornography. And um, so it is, is the shared language because there are pornographic networks? So is, are, are these acts that, that are going on, are they intensely privatized or are they being recorded and uploaded or there's a mixture of um, the two types of activity? Well, as Linda said, the age range um, has been quite vast. So what women have endured when they come and say they're in their 70s or 80s, or like Linda mentioned, 90s, this is not new. <laughs> you know, this is, this is from the beginning of time, I guess, where patriarchy and misogyny uh, shaped how societies function and how women and girls place in society is um, into a place of subordination, you know, controlled, uh, manipulated. Um, so um, I guess if we're driven by pleasure, if torturing someone is what gives you the most pleasure so you do what it is that gives you that pleasure so if burning somebody gives you pleasure i don't think it matters where you live whether you're in south america whether you're in canada whether you're in europe if the way anatomically and biologically we're functioning you know we have a pleasure drive and if that's what's motivating you, I think that's what drives what the actions of torture that people will inflict. So um, some of the women that come to us say they were trafficked not only in their communities, but across Canada. And some um, have said that they trafficked, they were trafficked outside of their country, like if they were from the UK, uh, they were trafficked into the EU somewhere. But the acts are the same. So for, I can only go that it's driven by their pleasure over and over again. But 
you have to understand also that pleasure is organized. Like if um, a child in the UK is trafficked into the, U, the EU to a group of perpetrators, they already all know what they're going to do because it's a group, it's a group think, it's a group um, support of each other. We all know what we're going to do. So the hype is already escalating because they all have the same thing in mind. So um, it's, a, it's a question that Linda and I have often thought about too, you know, it's like you don't need a book from the torturers in Canada uh, be, to be delivered to the torturers in the EU. It's like they already know what's driving their pleasure around the type of creativity they want to do. So we've said we have cre creativity on this side for Linda and I to create the models that we had to create to understand new, new awareness about non-state torture. We had to be creative here, but you, you have to step into their reality and realize that they're using creativity on a very different motivational issue for pleasure, for pleasure, for money, for uh, power. power, you know, so. If we want to answer the, answer the porn though, the, the porn is very common very common if even in the older women because they were you know eight millimeter uh, filming or uh, still life photography often their their father would be a photographer or they'd be taken to uh, photographers and um, so imagery of the trophies saving the trophies was common even in the older women and as you know as they get younger and younger the porn the the, the filming is is um, more digital but um, pornography is very common as because it's it's a way as we know for men to keep seeing the atrocity over and over and over again so it's that continuous thread of never ending pleasure for the perpetrator and never ending torture for the the victim yeah and they also it becomes a way in which um, torturers can learn about torture you know and that's right they actually them. teach they yeah. actually teach the boys though to torture like the women tell yeah. us their brothers were actually methodically taught by their parents how to torture the, their sisters so it was it was a taught behavior they used pornography in the grooming of them as well they would show the children pornography as a teaching tool so it's it's very methodically taught it's not as happenstance around the the pornography it's a, it's a tool of the of the uh, teaching the techniques of torture yeah and snuff comes up quite often, mm. really. Snuff you know, films, yeah. Snuff films, the imaging. Mm. For, for people who may not be familiar with snuff, can you explain what it is? Snuff is a, a, the real life of filming, of murdering a person in real life, and they film that. And then it's called a snuff film. And it's, it's a high commodity. It's very uh, profitable. And many, many women have, have told us that they've been witness to or been forced to participate in snuff filming. Or to, you know, it was, it was used to terrify them, yeah. you know, to threaten them. And for a long time, uh, as a society, we said, oh, this is, this is not true. But where we found the evidence actually was um, an article from the UK, where the police had um, discovered um, a pedophilic torturer who had negotiated with a Russian organized crime person to create a snuff film, the killing of a, a child. So, you know, the evidence is there. And in Canada, Linda and I have often talked about um, ex-Colonel William Russell. He um, killed two women, but he photographed his gradual uh, torture and destruction of them. And when it was went to trial, when he was caught and convicted, the idea that he really was making a snuff vil a film was never even uh, talked about. So here again, it's so important to name 
the reality if we're going to educate ourselves about what can happen, you know, and what does happen so that we understand the society that that mm. we're living in and that is progressing around us that is so destructive. I, again, I want to echo and say that's so important, like the the idea that these things didn't go on, that, you know, of course, babies aren't being raped. Of course, you know, mm. women are being tortured. Of course, there are no yeah. snuff movies. Now there is so much uh, recorded evidence of those crimes being committed it's indisputable that these things are going on right. and that and you know if you have an an incredible amount of wealth and power and access um i mean we know that the internet has basically facilitated that's right um, uh, abuse so that it can be stored and shared online and um yeah so and i and i always think it, it kind of what you end up seeing on a Netflix film is kind of a softer version of sometimes of what's going on at these um, at these real levels, you know, so what people are getting aroused by uh, what you see in dramas now people cutting themselves more hanging from hooks. Right. Um, so we're, we're seeing the images reflected back to us right. through popular yeah. culture all the time and yeah. I don't see them as fiction, you know, I see them as, as versions, you know, they are, they are fiction as in terms of that person is not being um, hurt when they're hung from a hook, but they're versions of actually what's really taking place, what's really the torture so, and destruction of, of women and children and animals. Um, so, and, yeah. And it's, and it's terrifying. Um, as you're talking, what jumps into my mind is one of the classes when I was teaching the nine and 10 year olds, one class, the whole class started talking about how frightened they were by the TV images that they were seeing, you know, and they were, because parents are busy, they weren't having that relational discussion to try to have some sense of uh, understanding and processing their emotion of fear. I ended up sending a form letter to all the parents to say to them, your children are being frightened by the images they're seeing on TV. They need some discussion. You know, they need to, um, to be listened to and there has to be some attention paid to what they're, what they're seeing. So, because if we don't have this conversation like you've entertaining today, very real Kathleen conversation about the reality, children, you know, our, our sense is to kind of normalize or to distance it. So for the children, if they have fear and they can't process it, Sometimes you have to just kind of distance it and just accept that, okay, maybe that's that's okay or something. And Linda and I have taught in older classes and, and the young people were just starving for a really straight conversation. You know, what is going on in our world? You know, what is pornography? What is prostitution? And now they're going to have to deal with, as you're dealing, um, bringing to us porn robots. What is going on? This has to be a very frank conversation. And uh, Linda and I had an interview the other day, and it was with a teacher. And she said that she had taught around the sexualized violence in a classroom. This is high school. You know, this is 17, 18 year olds. And a mother called up and was really upset that the teacher was talking about sexualized violence. Well, that's not healthy. Linda and I have had this conversation that to send children out into the world, trying to be naive is a form of neglect too, because they're confronted with some very uh, tragic realities that can place them at risk themselves if they don't understand the world uh, that's evolving around them. Yeah, I like what you talked about earlier that you tried to involve the parents because I guess in these very sensitive areas, 
involving the parents. And it's a bit like you said, like, uh, and I find this with my work, because I talk about being human and being in relationships. So I have to go back to some very basic questions, like, what, what does it mean to be a human being? You know, what does it mean to be in relationship? And I guess as human beings, because we're born and we live in the world, we may not be asking these existential questions each and every day about our existence. And actually, I think we need to, as a species, we need to be asking these questions because if we're not asking them, it means that um, if you like um, the kind of ideas that are driving our society in this crueler, as, like you said, the, this stuff has always happened, right? You, you go back a thousand years, it happened. Uh, women being raped and tortured. It's, but we live in a world that we've created through politics, right? We've created these values of equality and, and representation where we recognize each and every person as a human being. These are really um, aspirational principles, you know, and it's still happening now. And I guess that's what we need to address. Why, what's, and if it's still going on, we need the resources in society to actually target and prevent it because people will do things that they can get away with. Right. And uh, if they can't get away with it, then they have to work, they have to work harder. Mm -hmm. so there's lots of evidence, isn't there? Like, of course there was child abuse and child abuse imagery in circulation, but now they're finding that, uh, that men who would not typically view child abuse material are now viewing child abuse imagery, extreme child abuse imagery, because it's become normalized through digital culture. Everyone's isolated, uh, disconnected, alone at their computer. And so what they're viewing, they're becoming increasingly desensitized to what they're seeing. And over time, their, their kind of viewing habits become more and more extreme. So they are then, well, I would think, I think all forms of pornography should be abolished. But, um, you know, these are, these, this is a, a concrete example of how a phenomena can change behaviors and habits. Um, so what should we look do? At porn, look at Pornhub. I mean, here we have Pornhub in our country of Canada. And we had young women from all around the world come and testify that their image was housed through Pornhub and transmitted all over the world. And uh, saying that they felt it was torture because the violation was never ending, never ending. The cruelty of it was never ending. And yet our country has really done nothing. You know, so what message does that give to, to men who are making these images and uploading them onto porn? And then the ones that are downloading it from, from Pornhub, but what, it, it really gives them free reign until we start holding the, at least the businesses accountable. So to me, that, that's such a shocking reality that, that uh, we, Jean and I were part of that, a, a coalition of, a global coalition of abolitionists. So tell, us, that. tell us a bit about that because I've been following that. That's been so important. So uh, let's call it by its, its true name, Trafficking Hub. So uh, what's been happening to Trafficking Hub? Well, there's an ethics committee in our, in our uh, government that has been uh, the victims and other lobbyists and lawyers came and, and testified and Jean and I wrote a brief talking about the torture involved in pornography with children and women. And um, the committee was supposed to recommend something to our country. They have, have made recommendations, but we already have laws in our country against human trafficking. And, you know, the committee asked and we asked, why aren't those laws implemented? Why aren't those owners of that company held accountable? for promoting human trafficking and with the women telling their stories. I mean, they have actual real life women yeah. and the, the police have not been, um, you know, uh, they, haven't, they haven't followed through with any investigation. The government haven't ordered them to do any investigation. And uh, then we, we were on a, a global listserv where women from Colombia and Spain and uh, other countries in South America and Mexico and and uh, France and um, trying to think of India. The other, India, that's right, India, and then our own country. We gathered as a coalition and presented to the member of parliament that was the most concerned on the committee. And he had a press conference with all the women speaking of their different countries and, and all the, how their images from 
all those countries are all uploaded into, into Pornhub. And there wasn't even any press there to ask any questions. Mm. You know, I, it was yeah. dead silence. And, and the press is in, the media is responsible for this too, for not really taking these stories and building them up to be the important stories that they are. Because we're actually participating in facilitating the torture of women and children in our country. And as this, at this point, we're doing nothing about it. Yeah. Um, well, it's probably because they are watching pornography themselves and they're also participating in something. So taking a critical perspective on something. Um, sorry. We, we uh, wrote a, an op-ed and it was published and actually we've had some feedback um, from people who have read it and they're really disgusted with Canada. I'm disgusted with Canada because really what we're saying is that we're a, a destination country for the pornographic torture of uh, children, you know, and it's just like, let's create another structure to kind of deal with it. You know, it's like when you're thinking of empathy or thinking of trying to put yourself in the shoes of the women who have come forward and talked about what happened to them. It's like that doesn't even seem to register, no. does it? So we could send you the link uh, of the yeah, publication. Of, yeah. Well, well um, the next question, where does empathy come into your work? How does it work in for you, empathy? Well, we use a different term, but it's, you know, on the same continuum, we talk about caring all the time. You know, that because we're nurses, I guess that's a natural term that we come to. But I mean, in order to understand where women are coming from, we have to try to put ourselves in their place and understand where their lives were from their, from their childhood onward and help them to create language that could talk about what, what happened to them instead of using the perpetrator's language that they were, that they were taught. So caring is foundational to the work that we do. And the, the thing that really comes through in the, when we're working with the women is how caring they are. Even though they've been treated in the most horrific ways, I think it's the worst crime against humanity, the, the torture of your own child. Um, they still are very caring. So that teaches us that, you know, just because you've been treated in such a very objective, cruel way, doesn't mean that you have to become that way yourself. And it's, they've, they've gone opposite to the way that they were taught. So the, the empathy or caring is something that's inherent, I think, in children and they can fight to keep it. And they do, they do keep it. And um, tragically from the stories, like I mentioned, the boys are taught to be perpetrators. So, I mean, how are you going to expect a little boy to grow up to be caring if he's taught from the time he's tiny to be a perpetrator? that's that's the essence of it and then of course pornography teaches young boys and men to be perpetrators i agree with you i i think all pornography should be banned but it's certainly torture pornography should be and um, bdsm is on that continuum as far as i'm concerned because to teach that domination of another human being should be pleasure i just can't I can't go there, not if I'm basing my belief system on equality and the human rights and dignity of all of us. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I guess, um, you know, for me, I was, I used to believe it or not be pro pornography and pro, I thought prostitution, I would have used the word sex work. I would have thought BDSM was harmless. Obviously there's a softer version that's kind of more common in mainstream society. Obviously now it's even mainstream uh, society, society, it's getting harder and harder, you know, strangulation, um, burning, cutting, um, stealthing, all these types of acts. But, you know, and I can change, if I can change, but what led my, to my change, I guess, um, Part of it was learning about uh, children and attachment and what can happen to you, what can, what can go wrong in the attachment process, but also learning about radical feminism as well. Mm -hmm. You know, having a framework to make sense of these, um, what's going on in the world in a way that's different. Because I would say 99, there's radical feminist perspective isn't known by the vast majority of women it's either caricatured or it's misrepresented. 
And, the, and even pornography is one giant big misrepresentation because we're all led to believe that everyone who's participating in it wants to do it. But, you know, that's a tiny slither, isn't it, of what's actually going on. The vast bulk mm -hmm. of it is this abuse, is about this torture, is about, um, you know, using grooming devices and uh, women in vulnerability or even infants. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm totally with you on that one. Yeah, I, I, sometimes I, I'm thinking that with, with all of the victimization that's coming at us, that we're losing the fact that it is victimization. <clears throat> Linda and I were uh, um, presenting to a group and we were talking that we insist on using the term victimization because a crime has been committed against you. You've been victimized and that's why you have the responses you do, the trauma responses or the survival responses. And we had a woman there that said, well, for 30 years I've been going to therapy and nobody ever told me I was victimized. She was victimized uh, by an adult as a child. So, and what it takes me to, we had a, a discussion with some young women and they were confused about what sex was, if you will. Like, like it seemed to me that they were losing the concept that we have the right to say no mm. I, i'm not agreeing to this and linda had asked them well what do you mean by rough sex and they started talking that they were kicked and hit and bruised strangled. and strangled and it's like they did not seem to understand that they had the right to say no so here again i'm not sure if we're losing the abil relational ability to say we have boundaries, you know, we have a relationship. I have a relationship with myself and I have the right to decide what it is can be done to me or what I want done to me or what I don't want done to me. So I, I think we have to start really insisting on the right to say no, to understand what you're saying yes or no to. And to know, um, I mean, patriarchy and misogyny does not uh, entitle women and girls to a voice. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental kind of principle about oppression is that you don't have a voice and patriarchy is the one that decides. So we, we do have to flip that around uh, for, women and girls of all ages and children and boys too have to start knowing that girls and women have the right to say no and women and girls have to know they have a responsibility too to say no and the right to say no. So uh, that's kind of something that's circulating in my mind is, is that we're, it seems like because of the violence that's being normalized, we're losing that ability to say no. And if you've had children and you go to little children, one of the first words they start learning is no, <laughs> you mm. know, no, no, no. But it, it seems like patriarchy and the violence is erasing that uh, ability, if you will, to say no. I, well, I guess the, the ability to say no, women have always been saying no, whether other women have been listening to them saying no, I guess that's what radical feminism is, listening to other women like we began with. Because I, I got uh, three degrees and I didn't learn any radical feminism, but I learned lots of liberal feminism and other kinds of feminism that said uh, BDSM was great and free expression and prostitution uh, is what is a work is a job like any other and um, pornography is free speech mm -hmm. so even you know that's why these we've got to we've got to put these 
We've got to put our message into the world. Absolutely. We've got to keep putting our messages right. into the world so that other people can meet them because That's otherwise true. they're only going to be exposed to that. Right. And there are probably, I would say, deep in women's real experience is this desire not to be an object, desire to have a voice. But it's kind of like when everything around you, like you said, is making you invisible. And this mm -hmm. is just this is just very ordinary everyday experience for women you know um but you're what you're talking about is much more extreme than that so i'm i do want to talk about the sex differences here um you know because you probably read a bit of simon baron cohen saying men are you know empathize less than women so i wondered if there's a sex difference in in what you find is it normally men who who are committing because it's under patriarchy, but you also talk about women who are also torturers. So maybe if you could just add a bit of nuance about how, how it works. Well, I fundamentally believe that patriarchy is the, is the root cause of why may, men become more violent and women be, are more oppressed. And then there's variations of that because I brought up a son and two daughters and I know, you know, many men that are caring. So I, I don't, I don't go with the story that I looked a little bit up about what that research scientist was saying. And I don't really go with this theory because it seems like he's going back to blaming women. Huh? Neither do I, but he's, no. it's but very, I just thought it. Yeah. It's a very yeah. popular idea. It's amazing what, ideas that are very harmful actually they can have this wider purchase yeah i mean I, i'm kind of shocked that he's into this male brain and female brain i thought we debunked all that and now yeah, we're back yeah. at it again right so i think that babies are born caring and then how we treat them that's how they become we can over we can overindulge them and they can be abusive too not just from being harmed in, in other ways so and, and in this population, primarily the men are the perpetrators. There are women who are perpetrators, that's for sure. There's a lot of women enablers too in the families. So there's a continuum of women. But I would never say that it's only men that were the torturers because we'd be lying about the stories that the women tell us. And it's hard for them to talk about the women because there's this myth that all women are caring. You know, I think that we, as women, we have to embrace that that's a myth you know, that both both sexes have the ability to care. It's how we're socialized and how we choose, because I do believe that after a certain age, these people choose whether they're going to be perpetrators or not, because some women talk about their mothers, they die never wanting to harm, that even though they're the mothers, they don't get pulled in. And then other mothers eventually just say, I think they must say to heck with it, I'm going to go, go be a perpetrator, it's easier. And, you know, there's professional women that the first woman that came to us, Sarah, she was being harmed by, uh, tortured by professional women in our community. She, they were alleged perpetrators that were at presently torturing her. So we couldn't deny that reality right from the beginning. It's a hard one. It's a hard one to, to take. I think it was the hardest for me to, to really take because I wanted to believe that all women are caring, but I can't be honest. And it would be a lie to, to the women and their stories. And I, I can't do that. Yeah. And it, I think too, with patriarchy and misogyny, it's social conditioning. We're all born into the construction of our society. So we're all influenced by it. So women definitely can take on misogyny. I mean, really, I think that showed up in the US with the election, you know, women voted Trump in, you know, they, they went that route. Um, so I think uh, for the well, population- they only, they only had a choice between two men. And uh, I guess it wasn't like a real choice no. uh, of, a, of a variety of people. Yeah. Yeah, it's a tricky one because I guess there's this, um, stereotype, isn't there, that men are bad, women are good in radical feminism, but actually it's much more nuanced and complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's definitely when you're thinking about structures of power, you know, if you have economic resources, then that gives you different kinds of leverage, doesn't it, over how mm -hmm. you can be in the world and um, exert authority and power over others. Um, so, yes, I, I think 
Um, and in the, the family, you know, the kind of harms that can be experienced because a lot of the caregiving does fall on the, the mother to care for the child. And, and that can be a harmful relationship, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's important to be accurate and describe things as they are, not to like politicize uh, because otherwise you're you're not really representing things as they are you're just representing a dogma or a, mm -hmm. a viewpoint but do you ever get come back by including women in your yes yeah yeah and we're accused of saying that you know i understand that women are socialized and oppressed but there's a population of women that we know about that have a lot of positional power in the communities because you know some there are some women that have gained quite a bit of power in, in society. And they're not, they're not walking around blindly oppressed. They have power and they use it in the wrong way, just as women that have power use it in the good way. So they're not, I don't believe that they're oppressed. I believe that they've evolved to a point that they've chosen to be evil and chosen to harm others and, and they get pleasure from torturing. I don't say that's the predominant population of women, but that there is a, there is a pocket of women like that. And, I, and we're criticized in saying that that's really anti-women and that no woman is ever free, that they're, you know, we're always oppressed and so that they wouldn't be doing it of their free will. But from what we know, they're certainly doing it of their free will, this, this population of women. So that's not popular. It hasn't been popular with with some feminists for sure yeah um it's uh um oft, often in the uh the kind of porn bot industry and porn dolls often the the voices that get most amplified are the female voices that support them um and i and i mean quite uh deliberately amplified so social media is an amplification tool so uh, they can have algorithms ensure that videos that advocate in favor of certain kinds of pornography technology are the ones that are prioritized in listings around the subject. You know, yeah. um, there can be links to the work which can embed them so that they can be shared more widely and so on and so on. Um, I've, I've, I've been thinking about this myself <laughs> because if it's, it's one thing, you know, if you want to have a conversation with someone and, and discuss with them about the world and engage and try to persuade them to your perspective. And if they've never heard your perspective or if you've never heard that, that, then it's a consciousness raising experience for both of you. But these are women who have, who are actively taking the position to enforce a kind of new, a, a, a kind of patriarchal and harmful regime. And I think absolutely they should be called to account. Obviously things shouldn't, um, yes, it's a tricky subject this one, isn't it? It it's is, tricky. it is, yeah. We should well, it's, it's, it's hard work to be out of the box. I mean, we yeah. know that, you know, to, to say, okay, we know we've evolved as a species in patriarchy and misogyny and misopedia which is the hatred of, of children, you know, because really we cannibalize children, if you will, if you want to go to that extreme, which is true. Um, it's hard work because we're up against, you know, decades and decades and decades, centuries of our evolution. So it, it is hard, it is hard work, but on a positive note for me to understand patriarchy to understand misogyny and to sh and to understand how that shapes relationships and the culture we live in the positive for me is in understanding that i i don't go into hopelessness if you will you know i say this is the problem <laughs> you know it's an evolutionary process that we're in. So what difference can I make here? Mm -hmm. uh, contribute just like you're contributing. You know, it's like new ways of thinking. And to think about that in a positive way that uh, we're presenting outside of the box and asking people to think about 
you know, and that's what you're doing with the, with your program today. You're bringing it to the street, if you will, because Linda and I always say, we have to talk about this like we talk about the weather, at least in Canada, we talk about the weather a lot, but you have to be on the sidewalk having this everyday conversation in order to try to make a difference. So that's hopeful, you know, that uh, Linda and I talk about how privileged we are that we live in Canada because we can say what it is uh, we have to say um, in ways that women in other countries still do not have that privilege to be safe in what they're saying. So um, that's hopeful, you know, that's hopeful and appreciative and it is a positive uh, way for me uh, to think about the privilege that we have to speak and that we're speaking right now and that you're speaking with us. That's a privilege and that's a positive uh, intervention in my opinion. Yeah, and, and um, I, I mean, I've got 20 more questions but I won't go through them all. Uh, we'll have another chat in a, in a few months time. We'll, uh, I'll read your book. So tell me about your book. So it's coming out. It's, um, it's not going to be till October now. <laughs> not October, yeah. I know. Books always take longer than, than you're expecting. So Women yeah. in Silence, Our Refusal to Let Torture Traffickers Win. So just say a bit about your book. Well, it's been a long time coming. We've been talking about this book for 20 years. <laughs> Yeah. So it's pretty exciting that we're actually at the place that we'll soon have it in hand. Really exciting. And we just read a review today that one of the young feminists we've been privileged to meet wrote about it. And she, what's so moving for me is she talked about how calm she felt after reading the book, that it settled a lot of the worst examples and, and gave her a sense of understanding about it. So I mean, that's so thrilling. We've gotten a lot of very positive reviews from young feminists and older feminists, different ages. But it's our gift to the women that we've listened to for so many years to be able to, it's women on silence. It's their voices out in print and they'll be there forever now. They'll never be silenced again. And it's up to the world who reads it and what they do with what they read about and try to make a difference for them in the world because um, we, we just know that they've been invisibilized far too long. And the, the reality that women are not enduring torture is, is, is a, it's bizarre to think that, you know, why would women be excluded from torture? <laughs> you know, men are tortured in war and we think it only happens on the battlefield or in an embassy and the police. I mean, that's ridiculous. So yeah. it's just saying the reality that, my God, women and girls are being tortured all over the world. It's time to see it and to care about them and to do something about it. And for me, Kathleen, um, way back in 1993, when Sarah first came, I looked at Linda and said, oh, maybe we'll end up dying with this story because like there was no room anywhere, it seemed, to fit in a lot of the care, which is all in the book. Uh, we've, we've got ourselves in the book too, because we're women, you know, we, we write part of our own uh, historical journey uh, because we're all women. And if we're listening to each other, we have to put ourselves there. And maybe that's the issue of caring and empathy that you walk with someone. We don't talk about them. We talk with each other. So anyway, I, I looked at Linda way back in 1993 and said, we might die with this story. So the positive is for me is that we're not dying. I'm not dying with the, with the story and with the women's story. So it's out there. And Sarah, who the book is about our journey with Sarah because we had no starting point except caring that what she was telling us was horrific and we just couldn't ethically walk away. But we ended up going underground in how we cared because it wasn't safe for us in society 
to disclose what we had to do in order for her to survive and to heal. So it is that journey with Sarah and ourselves and how we made it through and the fact that um, I'm not dying, <laughs> silenced is uh, a thrill for me. It's a big positive that uh, we'll one day have that <laughs> in the fall in hand and uh, no silence. And it's the story of other women besides mm -hmm. Sarah too. All the some of the other women that we helped along the way. So it's a it's a combination of our stories and their stories together. So we're walking together, and that's what empathy is, or that's what caring is. We're with each other. They're not an object that we're helping. We're all together in this, and we stood with them, and we stayed with them, and we're still with them. Wow. And and I guess my question to you then is. How about empathy for yourselves? How do you care for yourselves when you're um, hearing these stories? Because, you know, I've, I've, um, I've heard things and I've seen things because the internet is out there and, you, and it's, it's, it's so excruciatingly painful. So if you're, if you're working with this on a everyday basis for an, over 20 years, I mean, how do you care for yourselves? How well, do you we have to yourselves. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a relationship with ourselves, each of us. So I care for myself the way that fits for me, and Jean cares for herself the way it fits for her. And then we care for each other mm -hmm. because that's who we had to talk to. Yeah. And it was, it was bru <laughs> brutal. I'm talking brutal those first early years, what we went through. So if we hadn't have had each other, well, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to do the work and, and survive it. You know, I I don't know what would have happened if I hadn't have been working with someone else and talking it through. I, I wouldn't have. I either either would have walked away from it or walked away from myself. So, the caring is is crucial. It, it is crucial, and it comes in many forms. You know, humor and listening and and um, you know all kinds of different ways. And I think for me, um, like I was born in family violence too, and I, I was sexually assaulted as a five-year-old. Um, and my mother left my father when I was about nine for the last time and walked into society where that was not the norm and there was a lot of backlash. So I grew up when you're talking about feminism, I think for me, it started way back there because I was privileged enough to understand what was happening. Uh, I was able to understand that my father was violent. I didn't internalize it in any way that it had anything to do with me. Even as a three-year-old, I knew it was his responsibility. Um, and like with my mother, and I talk about some of this in the book, you know, when I was sexually assaulted, you know, there was no blame put on me. Uh, it was that reality that the teenagers were, con were confronted. Uh, my mother took that action. Um, and when she left and as a single, if you will, undivorced uh, woman in society and looking at how much sexism and how much misogyny was directed her way, I understood that too. So I think for me, and because um, here again, it was the issue um, as a woman, her pay was very limited. Um, like I say in the book, she raised two of us on like $860 a year, you know, so we were poor. And I understood that my peers saw me differently because of that. So when you don't internalize it and you're looking at society and saying, you know, that's wrong, <laughs> what's going on around us. I think it builds resilience. So for me going into, into Sarah, 
I had that resilience. And um, I used to say to Linda, I don't know why sometimes I understand so much about what Sarah is bringing, bringing to us. It was like I really seldom ever felt that I didn't understand or that it was um, putting me down. Um, so I, I think uh, the, I think I carried resilience uh, into the relationship. And I think that's a positive that people have to understand that we can go through some very harmful and hurtful experiences and we separate experiences from ordeals because ordeals in the definition of the word is often can be life-threatening whereas ex an experience may not be. Um, so I, I, I feel it was my resilience that helped me pr protect myself, I guess, if you will, or be okay with myself in that journey. And of course, for Linda and I, we work together. We work together with, as a small group with Sarah and, and other women. So you were never alone, if you will, in what you were hearing. I, I think being alone and what you were hear, hearing is isolating. And that's in our practice, that's what we explain to the women that Linda and I work together. And so for the women who were talking, that they also know that it's not like a secret anymore. It's not like one person to one person. It's like a little mini group. So um, I think that that's healing too. And the other thing we did um, to care about ourselves and each other is anytime we had the opportunity to speak, like you're giving us this morning or this, um, is that we shared the time because we know that talking is healing. The ability to speak what you think and feel is healing. So right from the beginning, even if somebody said you have five minutes, generally we tried to share the two and a half minutes each because uh, it gave us that opportunity to talk and it's so important. And I think that that also is about self-care. Wow, that is um, everything you've said there. I resonate with so much. It's so powerful uh, what you've said and um, doing it together with each other. And I really, um, so I guess back to our original questions, are humans an empathetic species? W what are your final words? I think we have the potential to be an empathetic species. I think we have a long way to evolve to the place that we really, the majority of us are empathetic. I think we have a, a large population of cruel people. And uh, unfortunately, they a lot of them have a lot of power. But I always believe that goodness overcomes evil. And I, I do believe that it, it, it can, uh, you know, and I, I, I'm part of that group of transform, transformers to I think we're at a, a critical um, turning point in our culture, global culture, in how we're going to treat women and girls. And if we don't move beyond the brutality and the torture and the atrocities of whether it's human trafficking, torture in the home or prostitution or pornography, we're not going to survive as a species. I think this is a critical point in our evolution. And I do believe we will do it but it's, it's very painful and, and, and a very messy process. And for me, um, I've had to put empathy on a continuum because in coming intimately to know the tortures and human evil actions, I do feel that we have to look at empathy from a goodness perspective, but also from uh, accepting that those who create harm 
have empathy for themselves, if you will. And if they're a group process, if they don't achieve the pleasure they want, that and somehow they have empathy, if you will, evilism, empathy for each other, but we haven't pushed the creativity of our brutality far enough or we pushed it too far and then we get a bit frightened because some of the women said have told us that some of the torturers have said oh did we go too far you know so it's like it's like so much of our emotion can exist on a continuum you know um so I, I I have to think that for the population of the torturers that in some ways it's like ethics, you know, they have ethics about their ideology, you know, we want we want to inflict brutality, that's our goal, that's our ideology. Over here, I have an ideology of goodness that the fact that women have lived a lifetime, you know, because often they come to us in their late twenties, you know, or fifties or forties, that they've lived uh, a lifetime in the their own ethics, even though they haven't been exposed to the goodness ethics, somehow they know how to live that. So it just tells me that so many of our emotions are on that continuum. And if we have, if we're going to understand it, we have to understand the continuum where along the way does goodness keep going, but where does it stop and where does it get turned around? in a different way and like um like you're talking about the porn robots they probably would say well i have empathy for the men who can't have a relationship with a human woman you know they may say we have empathy that's why we're doing the por the porn robots so yeah. it's like we have to understand very, that too yeah it's a very um Terms like this can be used in the surface of all kinds of agendas, mm. so it's really important. Mm. And um, I have to agree, I mean, the work that we do, I th for me, it's having a belief in love as something that can transform us, Absolutely. that we can heal from if we've been harmed. And um, love not as this, not as you know, we, we're dominated by love in our society, but it's all about romantic, romance, romantic and sexual love. I'm talking about love, which is this deep compassion and connection with each other. And I think, you know, for me, that's all, all I can do in my work is try and cultivate that kind of politics of love. And it's like you said, I think it's, it's situations like you're, you're in with the women that you're with love i'm sure is it's so powerful in terms of helping them to heal and healing oneself as well love yeah. as a we use the word care though because if yeah. we use the word love love for them it would be disastrous because love has been so the word so distorted for them in the torture like their parents say we love you this is why we do this and of course families are loving and so women, the women are so needy, they want us to be their family. So we can't tell them we love them because we could never be a family to all the women that we help. But we always tell them that we care about them. And, you know, we tell them that caring is the key. And that's, that's the thing that comes through the most is that in the end, they say, that's right, caring is the key. We wouldn't have been able to do any of this work if it wasn't with the foundation of deeply caring about them because nobody's ever cared about so many of them ever in their whole lives. So we use the word care for that reason, but it's all in that continuum of caring and love and compassion and empathy. And that, that's the answer to all of our problems in the world is we have to care about ourselves and those around us. I totally agree. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, a lot of questions we didn't get through, but we'll get through them 
uh, next time we have a meeting and um, I will let you know when it's up and I will try and share and thanks ever so much for this very important conversation today and have a great morning. Bye for thank now. Thank you, Kathleen. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you, Kathleen. Great conversation with you. Yeah. Hmm. Bye we'll for look now. forward to hearing it. <laughs> yes.